Live from the back of Ruth the Realtor's car, it's the Stacking Deed Show. I'm Ruth's neighbor and part-time mechanic, Doug, broadcasting live from the spacious, luxurious Trunk Recording Studio. Think you need a real estate empire to reach your goals? Think again, because today we share how you can nurture a few properties into something that helps you become independent and able to enjoy life by talking to a guy who's done it. Get ready to learn from Coach Chad Carson. In our headlines, one big-time advisor says you should stop putting money into your traditional 401k and IRA plans. What? More money towards real estate? We'll share some investment strategies. Plus, we'll answer a TikTok question one listener presented on Ruth's rotary phone. And, of course, I'll step in about halfway through today's shindig with an amazing real estate trivia question. And now, two people who are buckled in for today's podcast say hello to Crystal Hammond and Joe Saul Sihai. Welcome, listeners. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Stacking Deeds podcast. And actually, today we're triple buckled in. Me and my pal Joe here at Average Joe Money on so Twitter. Scary. This is so scary. <laughs> Well, today Ruth has an eye exam, so we're trying to figure out if it's time to take grandma's keys. <laughs> we got the cup holder open again today, so Doug can join us. He's going to flop around the back a little bit, Crystal. Yeah, so people no, need hear for, the... no need for me to be buckled in back here. <laughs> <laughs> if people I'm hear... fairly well contained. <laughs> we got a, a few extra pillows back there for him. I couldn't so fly I... through the windshield go. if I wanted to. <laughs> Crystal, it's an exciting episode today because Chad Carson joins us, a.k.a. Coach Carson. People call him. He played football for Clemson University as a wide receiver. Now he is a real estate investor that I think a lot of people in this community may already know. But he is talking about, do you truly want to build an empire? Do you want this to be another full-time job, Crystal? Or do you want just enough that you can do whatever you want to do? Just enough. Yeah, I'm very excited about his conversation about just enough. Just enough. You Sounds have to like have high balance. School. You have to have balance. <laughs> He's going to turn us into small and mighty investors. So great stuff there. But before all that, we've got a great headline for everybody, Crystal. This piece comes to us from Investment News. Ed Slot tells us, This decades-old strategy no longer works. He says to stop contributing to your IRAs and 401ks, and he has something. What? What What did you think when you first saw this? Did you think what I thought? Like, what the hell are you talking about, Ed? Ed's a smart guy, by the way. If people don't know Ed Slot, back in the 90s, early 2000s, he was on NPR all the time. You know, they do those fun drives and then they'd have Susie Orman on sometimes mm. you remember any of these crystal no nope um before but, my time <laughs> but they would sometimes have Ed Slot and Ed Slot's like America's tax advisor but when Ed says stop contributing to IRAs and 401ks I was like hold on a minute right I was like there has to be another way I'm pretty tax savvy my original blog name was sophisticated taxpayer but yeah that was a little bit long <laughs> It should have been That's, sophisticated. Did you get all the four followers with that one? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, my mom was always the first follower and she would actually call to make comments. She wouldn't. Nope. Oh, she perfect. Would not, not on the Internet. Nope. She would call. But I can <laughs> totally see the method behind the madness or myth, madness behind the method. Because he's saying when you're adding to your 401ks, well, the bottom line is go Roth instead. Yeah, And the big reason is the Roth is after tax money, adding to these balances, they only increase your future tax bill in retirement. And a lot of us will be making less in retirement. First of all, being a government employee, we actually have a Roth TSP. That's like a Roth 401k for a lot of people. Yeah, that's our Roth 401k. And another new rule that he actually talks about is... Now companies can match your Roth contribution. That's huge because that's why, you know, people always say, hey, contribute to your 401k, at least to the max, because that's free money. You get a match. But now your Roth 
has a match function. The interesting thing here for me is that what Ed's saying is, is that we're at low tax, tax rates. rates. Yeah. The tax rates are lower than they've been in a long time. They're actually super low when compared to the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, mm -hmm. even the early 90s. It was starting in the early 90s that we saw tax rates begin to come down to the lows that they are today. So for people thinking that we're getting taxed a lot, historically, that is not the case. It's However, Crystal, I mean, we should always still pay attention to the tax bite, but the way Ed says to do that is ignore that little tax bite today and pay attention to the future when tax rates have to go up. What's funny is we had a headline last week that happened in the major news. We didn't talk about it here on Stacking Deeds, but what happened to the U.S. debt? It got downgraded. And the reason mm -hmm. U.S. debt got downgraded last week was because we have too much debt and everybody yeah. knows that we're either going to default or tax rates are going to go up. And I would bet, Crystal, along with Ed's lot, that the U.S. won't default on its debt. They will actually begin finding ways to raise tax rates. And if that's the case, the Roth is a great place to be. What does that do to the real estate investors? So what this has to do with real estate is that this is giving you another tool in your toolbox to do some tax planning and stuff like that. Because another thing Absolutely. they say in this article is, hey, won't the tax deductions from our IRA and 401k contributions be lost? But you're listening to this show because you want to do some smart tax planning. That's a good thing because I like this line, tax deductions aren't worth as much when tax rates are low as they are now. And smart tax planning means taking incomes when rates are low and then taking tax deduction when rates are high. So taking income, like we want more of the income now, and then we want to take those tax deduction later when the rates are high. I even, Crystal, look at this through even more of a macro lens, and that is that a lot of people think about the investments that they have whether they have real estate and even what type of real estate they have, right? Short-term real estate, long-term real estate, my flipping houses, all of those have different tax consequences, I think is my big yeah. aha here. And those are going to play different depending on what tax rates are. They'll play different in the future than today. And I'll give you an example here. Even though they're used for different types of things, real estate prices move in a pretty boring up and down. There isn't a lot of motion mm -hmm. in that ocean. We get some big years where it goes up like it has, you know, the last few years are down very quickly, 2007, 2008, looking at you. Those are anomalies. You'll see those in the stock market a few times a year. You won't see those in the real estate market that often. So when you look at the volatility, the volatility of real estate compares a lot with the volatility of bonds. And if you take a look at the volatility in real estate and the volatility in bonds, you think, okay, one should be, they might be interchangeable, shouldn't be. Real estate's actually, mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons, better for a long-term portfolio. But look at the tax difference between an average bond and a piece of real estate. They can both throw off income, income from the tenant, right, in the case of real estate, or interest payments on the case of a bond. And unless it's a municipal bond or partly qualified, though, the bond's going to be 100% taxable. Mm -hmm. And if you're not using the money and you reinvest it, you're still paying tax on it anyway. That money, though, that the renter pays you can be offset with maintenance costs, offset interest, by yeah, property interest, taxes, interest cost, on your mortgage, all kinds of cost of doing business. You got your depreciation schedule, real estate, far more tax advantage than a bond is in just in general. And to get the same or similar tax advantages with a bond, you got to go to municipal bonds or federal government bonds where they'll be partially tax qualified. And when you do that, you lose your rate of return. With real estate, real estate rate of returns can still be fairly high. That return can stay pretty high and you're getting a tax advantage investment. That's why, you know, if somebody's looking at real estate versus bonds, I'd still look at the time frame. If it's a short time frame, I'd still go with bonds. But if I'm looking long term, I'm looking at real estate way before I look at bonds. That's true. Even for capital gains, when you're in the stock market, first of all, that money you're investing also is after tax. And then yeah. the money that you earn is definitely taxed. So even to stop contributing to the Roth and going into the, I mean, the regular 401k and going to Roth, that is you're using your pre-tax monies too, but you're getting a tax advantage later. You don't get That's a tax advantage later for those other investments. No, if you go with a pre-tax 401k, pre-tax IRA where you deduct it, 
or if you do this full time or enough that you can have a simple and we should talk about, you know, building these supplemental retirement plans for people that do this full time or do it enough that they're bringing in good income and want another tax shelter. So building in some diversification, maybe for those people though, you're going to get a tax break today. And then later on, it's all going to be taxable. And that's what Ed's saying. I wouldn't chance it. Yeah. What's funny is I don't know that I a hundred percent agree with him. I see where he's going, but you know, our co-host and mutual friend over at Stacking Benjamins OG says tax diversification is better because Crystal, you don't know when these tax rates are going to go up. You don't know when things are going to happen. So if you've got a little bit in each pot, it's going to give you the more flexibility. Everybody solves for optimization. You engineers Mm -hmm. are particularly prone to that. (laughs) You guys all solve Crystal for optimization, but solving for flexibility is another great thing to solve for. Hmm. I do have a mix now, but I'm trying to decide if I should switch just because now I'm able to pivot and, you know, cut back on certain things or work harder or work more hours or pick up a second job. But I feel like in retirement, I'm really not going to want to be as flexible. I'm like, dude, I did all my time. I put in my work. I'm ready to retire. I don't want to work harder. I want that predictability of how much I'll be taking out each month and and sipping my margaritas. (laughs) When you get these new properties built that you're working on right now, I mean, we're about to talk to Chad Carson. Yeah. You're going to have this consistent income stream coming in where, you know, you have to work on them some. I think this idea that it's quote passive income is a lie, but what? An hour a week, two hours a week? Like we'll talk, I I bet Chad doesn't spend more than three or four hours a week on these properties that he has. Um, When you're on autopilot. Yep. Yeah. So bottom line, and our piece here, going Roth instead is going to be good for you. It's going to be good for your bottom line in retirement and for tax planning. But speaking of taxes and tax planning, we have another piece here. This one was a really good podcast episode from Devin Carroll and John Ross. They host the Big Picture Retirement Show they actually have an entire episode on hiring a tax advisor. And what I liked most about this episode (laughs) is that they go through the different kind of people that you can hire. You know, you have your CPAs. Well, first they say there is actually no education requirements for you to file taxes for others. I thought that was kind of crazy. But you just put your flag out and say, hey, I'll do your taxes for you. (laughs) Pretty much. There you go. Boom, yeah. you're hired. And I do like that prepare. because it because it can be scary. You know, I mean, when you're hiring somebody, it is very possible to hire the wrong person. And that can yeah. that can break you. Just like we want to have good general contractors that we know. We want to have True. good handymen. We want to have maybe property managers or maybe not, depending on you. But you want to surround yourself with good people. So having a good tax advisor is going to help you make a decision on not only how you invest in real estate, but how it fits into your entire plan. And I feel like all the tips that they gave definitely carry over to the real estate. Like you said, the hiring of the property managers, your mortgage broker, your realtor, because they say do an interview. Like, I think a lot of us don't know that we have the power to interview who we want to trust with our social security numbers and all (laughs) of our financial information, you know, check them out online. I feel like we've said this so many times, rock stars love to hang out with rock stars. So if I have a great tax person, I'm going to refer Joe and neighbor Doug to my rock star tax person. But if there's a awful tax person, that word would spread really quickly too. And what's funny is that they point out is that awful can be that you're just hiring the wrong type of tax advisor for your situation. They point out that there's really three different tax advisors that you can have. The first one is just called an enrolled agent. And to your point, Crystal, this can be somebody who's just passed some very simple tests with the IRS. They have a basic tax knowledge. A lot of the times an enrolled agent will work for a company like an H&R Block, if you think about that, or Hewitt or some of the other big national companies. They will have a lot of enrolled agents, not people who are CPAs. And when I originally heard this, Crystal... I thought, and this episode is several years old, but it still holds completely Mm -hmm. today. When I first heard that, I'm like, oh, I think I want a CPA. My person is a CPA. And they actually helped me come down kind of on the other side. If you find a good enrolled agent, 
if you do a lot of interviewing and you find a good enrolled agent, that person, especially for people just starting out, can be a really big help and also might know the tax code as well as a CPA who doesn't ever do taxes for individuals. Because a lot of CPAs work for corporations and they're working on corporate taxes. And they don't know anything. Like I've got friends that are CPAs. Like, I don't know anything about like filing a 1040. Right. Because they do auditing. They do a whole gambit of stuff outside of individual taxes. So that is a good point to find someone that actually does real estate. And you want to ask how many do you file per year? Is it too many? Is it too yeah. little? But I also like how they also talk about a tax preparer versus a tax advisor also, because a preparer, a lot of times they just look at what you've done, but you also want that advisor piece to look forward and like, hey, this is where you're missing out on deductions. And this is where you're missing out how you're spending and how you're planning is huge when it comes to the IRS, because you can be missing out on huge things on stuff you never knew. So I would love to go in the arena of tax advisors versus just preparers too. Yeah. Ultimately, I think for us, we want somebody that does both. So as we're evaluating a property, yeah. we can bring them into the fold and go, Hey, is there something I should do with my business around this? You know, one of the big questions, do I put it in LLC, right? That's the, like the number one question huge. people ask all the time. Not the first question to ask, but it is a huge question. People always have all of these things that a great tax advisor could answer and a great analogy. Cause I know there's people probably listening going, well, what really is the difference? A great analogy, I think, is if there's a puzzle, a good tax preparer will take the puzzle of all the stuff that you did last year and will put the puzzle together in a great way, in the best efficient way. They go, oh, Crystal, you did this, you did this. We can write off this. We can't write off this. We can do this thing. Hey, give me your mileage. Give me the paint that you used. Give me, you know, oh, you had a handyman fix the furnace. Give me all that information. Puts all that puzzle in. A tax advisor tells you which puzzle you should be putting together. There's a whole bunch of different puzzles. Tax advisors like, Crystal, don't waste your time with that because um, that puzzle's awful. Do this puzzle instead. Do less do you, of that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely want an advisor on your team. But I do like it if it's the same person. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because they know me enough to advise me and then they can also put it together. I super like that. That brings up a third type of person, which is a tax attorney. Now, a tax attorney probably shouldn't, they say, shouldn't be preparing your taxes for two reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one, they probably don't do a lot of returns. And number two is that's not really what they're good at. A tax attorney is good at that LLC question or what type of entity should I set up? Or if I have a lawsuit, right? Against, yeah, against, fighting against, the IRS yes. or fighting on your behalf if you made a mistake. Yeah, tax lawyer going to be really expensive and in most yeah. cases is not going to be as helpful as either enrolled agent or a CPA who also does tax returns and tax advising. And another thing they caution too is when you go to your tax person, are they asking you a lot of questions? Do they just want you to hand over the stuff? They'll figure it out. Or are they asking you questions, explaining the why? The more you spend here, the better it benefits you for tax purposes. So make sure you're also getting a person because I'll never forget a friend of mine years ago, she had a business and she was like, I need you to look over my taxes because I think there's something off. So I looked at her return. I was like, this is totally wrong. And so we confronted the guy that she paid a lot of money to file. And he said, oh, I couldn't open the file you sent. So I just put in some numbers. So he thought that she'd be OK getting the refund and not question it. But I was like, no, you're owed so much more money. Oh, my goodness. And the bottom. Yes. He didn't even open her files and look at it. So make sure your person is very interactive and they're asking you questions and they are actually explaining things to you. And you can say, explain it to me like I'm five or well, that, explain it to me like I'm not an engineer. When I was my first year as a financial planner, and I've been very open about this, I made roughly $90,000 and mm -hmm. about a week before tax day, because as I've also said very publicly, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I didn't know a bunch. I knew how to talk to people. I had great people behind me that actually knew finance. So I felt very comfortable. I'd talk to them. I'd take it to the back room and go, hey, help me put this person's thing together, right? Mm -hmm. So about a week before tax day, I go, oh, crap, I haven't done my taxes yet. A week. Well, Crystal, I owned a franchise, which meant that I was not a W-2 employee. I got a 1099, which meant I had $90,000. Guess how much tax I'd withheld? 
None. None. Guess how much I knew about what I could write off? Nothing. I knew nothing. So I go to a friend, guy named Lee. Lee's like, oh, take it to my guy, Bill. Bill puts it together in a week. Bill says, after I give him my stuff, he doesn't question anything I give him, by the way. Mm -hmm. Doesn't question anything, just puts it all together. Says, you owe $14,000. I could have owed, by the way, $100 and I didn't have it. I could have owed $50 and I didn't have it. So when he said $14,000, I flipped out. Later on, when I hired a woman named Susan, I realized I probably, Crystal, didn't owe $14,000. I had Mm -mm. so many deductions as a business owner I didn't know about. Now, I still would have been in trouble with the IRS, but it would have been a lot less trouble if I'd had a good tax advisor. And by the way, when I finally got out of not my debt, which included IRS debt, because guess what I decided to do when I couldn't pay my $14,000 bill? I decided I just wouldn't file it. I don't know if you guys know this, but if you don't file your taxes, good things happen later. (laughs) 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 The reason you've never heard that is because it's totally not true. That ended up being a monster tax bill later that was almost Uh all penalties. And because I buried my head, the ostrich that you talked about, Crystal, you know, I got so far behind it that, and I didn't have any receipts to prove anything. So I ended up having to pay all this money that I didn't really. So get good tax advisors as you're building your empire. Yeah. They will set you up for so much success. They'll be like, oh yeah, get a business card, put everything on the business. Like it'll help you organize your life too. Oh, some little things. Little yeah, things. Nearly the only time I listen to Spotify is when I'm working. I am hmm. sitting at my desk. I'm working. And so Susan was like, you listen to it 90, 95% of the time when you're working. Yes. That's a business expense. Oh. My Spotify is a business expense. She goes, don't get me wrong. Don't tell your buddy that. Cause they might use it, you know, 90% of the time when they're out fishing or doing whatever they're doing. <laughs> but for you, if you're listening to it when you're working, you know, on the stacking Benjamin show, we talk about every movie I go see during our show. So I get to write off my movie tickets. We don't write them off for Cheryl, but we write off the ones for me. So we can. There's an IRS agent right now thinking, (laughs) I know who we're targeting next. Let me name all the movies. But that's, but that's why you have a great tax advisor. I asked Catherine and she took me through all these questions. I can't deduct the popcorn. I can't deduct the $85 popcorn. The good news is I save on the $6 Tuesday afternoon ticket, Mm -hmm. but the $85 popcorn, I actually have that come out of my own wallet. But anyway, so there are some expenses as a business owner that you get. All right. Coming up next, speaking of business owner, you may think, especially if you're new to the world of real estate, that you need to build this huge kingdom to get where you want to go. Chad Carson's a guy who has proven specifically that you don't need a ton of properties to get where you want to go. And frankly, for a lot of us, it's not even what we want. Chad spends very little time each week managing his portfolio, his very small portfolio properties. And guess what, Crystal? Last year, he took his family. They moved to Spain. They moved to Granada, Spain. (sighs) And he has had this wonderful experience. He's also moved to South America and lived in South America for a couple of years. He truly lives his best life spending a lot of time doing what he wants with his family and not managing his real estate empire. We'll talk about how he got there, about his story and about how you Dieters can get there. But before that, I think, Doug, you've got some trivia. Sure do, Joe. Hey there, Dieters. I'm Ruth's right-hand man, neighbor Doug, and it's time for your property pop quiz. Remember this date back in 2007? You're probably chilling on Coney Island Beach, listening to big things popping by T.I. and wondering how many shares of Apple you were going to buy with all the shmoney in your fat wallet. Not so fast, Brooklynite, because on today's date back in 2007, not only was the real estate meltdown just over the horizon, so was a weather meltdown in Brooklyn. In the early morning hours, a rare tornado ripped through the borough. It was the strongest tornado ever to be recorded in New York history, which makes me wonder what state has the most tornadoes each year. You know, so I can uh, steer clear of that terror trap. I'll be back right after I go look it up for both of us. Hey, guys. I know that I've mentioned a ton of property management softwares out there, but... I'll give you three reasons why this one is different. First, software doesn't really 
solve your problems. Yeah, and that's why Hemlane's property management provides 24-7 repair coordination. That's right. Use your own service professionals or you can tap into their licensed network. Second, many of you are out of state like myself. So Hemlane connects you with licensed leasing agents and other tenant placement services to help you find and place a good tenant. And third, Hemlane's ranked number one by Gartner with a 4.8 star review. So they, Crystal, are legit, which is what we like best. Yes. So manage your rental properties with 100% transparency and control without the administrative work, the boring administrative work through (laughs) Hemlane. They offer everything from advertising your rental to over 30 rental websites and automatic rent collection and late fees. Best of all, you can tap into their network for a more hands-off and remote experience. Hemlane will increase your satisfaction and your cash flow with your rental properties. So visit hemlane.com. That's H-E-M-L-A-N-E.com. And don't forget to mention to tell Hemlane you heard about them through Stacking Deeds because we're an affiliate of them. When you tell them, you also help out yourself and you help the show. Hemlane will dramatically Improve your property management. Hey there, Dieters. I'm our resident weather forecaster and real estate fix-it guy, Roots Mechanic, neighbor Doug. Today, we're marking an event 16 years ago, the strongest tornado in New York history, which ripped through Brooklyn. Luckily, no serious injuries or fatalities were reported as a result of the tornado, but several people were treated at area hospitals for flying glass injuries. At least 40 buildings and 100 cars were damaged by the flying egg creams and hipsters yelling, forget about it, trying to sound like locals. This is so rare in New York that we wondered, in which state are tornadoes most common? The answer? If you guessed Kansas, well, we ain't in Kansas anymore, Toto, because it's actually Texas that ranks numero uno on the tornado tragedy list. In an average year in Texas, they get a whopping 151 tornadoes a year, while Kansas was a distant second with a measly 91 a year. If you're in Texas or own properties there, it's probably a good idea to check that homeowner's policy. And now that you got that question right, I'm sure you did, it's time to make yourself financially independent with our guest, Chad Carson. And I'm super happy he's joining us. Coach Carson on Stacking Deeds. How are you, man? I'm doing great, Joe. Thanks for having me. Okay, question number one. Clemson football, you guys returning to the national championship this year? I sure hope so. I'm like an orange colored glasses fan. You know, I played football there, but I don't analyze it for real. I just like get excited about it and say, yeah, we're going to win it all. Let's go. So I I think we have have it. We have a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, (laughs) you actually do have a shot, which is the good thing. I got to think, you know, I mean, those teams that went to the national championships and people are like, I thought this was going to be a real estate show, by the way, but hold on. (laughs) We'll get there, everybody. But you had to look at the rise of like Clemson football after you were gone and go, dude, man, I wish I was there those years. I hope that's not a direct correlation or coincidence. You know, I hope it's just a coincidence that I left and Clemson got better. But yeah. now, I like to say that I laid the foundation and now, now they have a, it is. They, they've built the real estate. Here we go with real estate. They, I built the foundation and they built the real house where they actually had the trophies. You're welcome. The you're welcome, Clemson. Yes, that's what exactly. you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. All right. You open up this new project of yours with a quote that I want to read to you and to our Dieters. Isn't it curious that the richer you are, the less time you can spare from tending your riches by switching to a new game, time becomes the only possession and everyone is equally rich in it. Money, of course, is still need to survive, but time is what you need to live. That's a guy named Ed Buren vagabonding in Europe and North Africa. Why do you begin with that quote? You know, money is the thing we always quantify. We talk about it's important. And I love talking about money as well, but Every time I've asked myself and I talk to other people about why they want to make money, usually it has to do with some activity, some event, something they want to do, and they need time to do that. As I've studied my own life and the mistakes I've made and the wealth I've been trying to build, often I will go chasing the money, and that's fine. But then I kind of get overbalanced towards the money and forget that, you know what, I need more time to be with my kids, to travel, to do these things. And yes, I need some money to pay for those things. But if I don't balance that with having time and money and speaking with real estate investing, not having a business model that, yes, makes money, 
but doesn't overwhelm your time and empty your time bank account so that you can't use your money. That's sort of the game I've been trying to play to try to you know, not just have the one measurement of success, but having time, money, flexibility, health, relationships. It's a more challenging version of measuring success. But in the end, if you can do that, if you can build a business and investing protocol that can help you do that, it's so much more fulfilling and satisfying. You bring up a great fact, which is that money is one currency, but all those things that you answered are just other currencies. I mean, that time is a currency, right, that you're trading. It's limited. It's the most limited currency we have. We all have, you know, 24 hours in a day. Nobody's guaranteed how long you're going to live. So I mean, you can actually get philosophical with this. You know, you're here on this earth for however long you're going to be. You're not guaranteed. So what are you going to do with that time that you have? Money, as hard as it is to make, as hard as it is to save, you can actually, I mean, theoretically make as much of it as you want. Time is very limited. So I think when you're stacking those currencies, to use the stacking metaphor, you want to stack the Benjamins, you want to stack the money, but don't do it at the cost of those. And I got into this because when I first started real estate investing, I got into the rah-rah, let's have 100 properties, 1,000 properties. And it sounds exciting. It sounds fun. But as I learned, when you start building these big, huge empires, or trying to at least, it sucks all your time out. It gets your flexibility. And so I started embarking on trying to figure out a different way to invest that didn't take all my time, yet still built a lot of money and a lot of wealth. Half of this project for you is philosophical, and you dove into that with our sister show, Earn and Invest with Doc G. That was a great interview. We're also going to do a shorter version where you and I are going to talk more philosophically about that and about why you build it this way over on Stacking Benjamins in the next few weeks. But this is a tactical show. So I want to get to that piece here, which Doc G didn't do, and we're not going to do on Stacking Benjamins. When you first started out, you were on this big empire train, but you kind of had to be, right? I mean, you didn't have any money. So you talk about you actually began flipping houses. Why did you start there? Yeah, I just graduated from college. My Clemson football days, I stopped playing football. I had this like Forrest Gump moment where I was training for the NFL and I thought I would be in the NFL, but I was running and running in the middle of the day in the heat. And I said, I'm done. I can't do this football thing anymore. I'm going to stop now. And I decided that I wanted to be an entrepreneur just before I did anything else. And so I just got into real estate investing, not knowing a lot. I had a family member who was in real estate, but I had to make money because I had a thousand bucks in the bank and I just had to flip houses. It was basically a business of making money. It was very helpful because I learned how to find good deals, but it was challenging because I didn't have any money. I had to go partner with other people. I had to get really creative and flexible. Real estate was just a mode to get some cash in your pocket. Exactly. I was just flipping stuff. You know, people flip cars, they flip houses, they flip stuff on eBay. I was just flipping big old houses and it was just a little more challenging to, to get the money, but it was also exciting. And it led me to this game of stacking rental houses buying them, keeping them, holding them, generating income. The, the flipping was just to pay the bills, but the wealth building was actually holding the properties. And I looked at them like fruit trees. You plant these seeds, the rental properties don't make money overnight, but man, five, 10 years later, those fruit trees can really grow and then produce income and wealth for a long time. Yeah, you write that it wasn't long before you switched over to long-term rentals, which is, you say, it was your favorite strategy, has been your favorite strategy. When you had this aha, it doesn't sound like, though, you had this aha right away. You know, you just said you're planting seeds. I can't imagine that planting these trees was the aha that you got right away. The aha must have come later. I usually have aha moments when I touch the fire and get burned. So that's how I learned, unfortunately. <laughs> usually, the, usually the third time I touch it. <laughs> yes. Oh, fire. Oh, fire. Oh, fire. <laughs> That's pretty much what I did in 2007 and eight. If people remember the Great Recession and how real yeah. estate pretty much drugged the entire world into the Great Recession. Well, my brilliant self and my business partner, who is smarter than me, we bought 33 properties in one year. Hey, let's go do this. Let's buy a bunch of properties. If one property is good, let's do 33 of them. And most of them were good, but there were some bad deals. There were some that were negative cash flow. There were some that are bad locations. And so I, I got taught about the fundamentals of real estate investing, of long-term investing, because I had to, because we had to keep those properties. And fortunately, we survived. A big part of that was just having cash reserves. We had lived really frugally before we got into the Great Recession. So we had to eat into some of our cash reserves for a couple of years. But the lesson on the other side of that was we survived. <laughs> that was great. And because we survived, the best purchasing time of all time was 2010, 11, 12, yeah. right after yeah. the recession when nobody's, you know, nobody's left or the people who are getting into it can just buy a lot of deals. But so, there was still a lot yeah. of fear in that market. I mean, living Absolutely. through that, Chad, there was a ton of fear. Did you realize what a great time it was at the time to buy? Or were you like, we could totally be stepping in it now? 
Yeah, I'm still the guy who touches the fire, remember? So I'm not that brilliant looking ahead, but I realized three or four years later that it was a pretty amazing opportunity. But I think here's a, a lesson for if people, especially if you're just starting, like right now in 2023, people are like, oh, you should not get in the market. The market's too high. I didn't know even at the time that what markets we were in, but what you can tell is looking locally at the dynamics in your local market and, and studying like, you know, what's a good deal? Like just understanding how much rent do you need to make a good deal? What prices are good deals? Studying how many properties have sold in your market? Like those fundamentals are what really matter for a real estate investor buying locally. And yes, like interest rates matter. Those kind of things affect you. But what I did in 2009, 10, 11, was just what's a good deal. It was all, a little bit of tunnel vision. But because of that, I was able to just buy good deals at that point. And I've done the same thing in 2023. Like, it's just the fundamentals of the fundamentals of the fundamentals. Yes, you got to be flexible. Yes, you have to adjust. Often the financing is what you have to adjust. But yeah. the, the fundamentals of real estate don't change no matter what market we're in. You were only buying locally, right? Yeah, I bought in Clemson, South Carolina. And this yeah. is a college town. So we have almost 30,000 students and 15,000 people who live here locally. So it's like just a university. And so we, I started buying small multifamily properties as my buy and hold rentals. We also had some single family houses and some mobile homes that we rented out. So we have a variety, but our kind of bread and butter at that point that we really ran with was uh, local kind of lower price student rentals that were walkable on the bus lines. People went to campus. And so once I got a house hack that worked, I, I moved into one unit. It, rented out the other three. And I was like, huh, this is working pretty well. And uh, then did another one and did another one. And that's been very effective just to kind of run with that one strategy for us. Wait, so, so you house hacked one quad and then you house hacked a second, meaning you moved, you lived there for two years and then you moved? Yeah. I well, actually my, I got married and my wife and I lived there at least three or four years. And then we outgrew the little two bedroom apartment and moved to a house at that point. Okay. Um, but, but, but was my, that part of a four door unit as well? No, it actually just moved okay. into a regular old house, which is another kind of form of house hacking. Like we lived there for a couple of years. And once we outgrew that house, we kept that as a rental. And so it wasn't technically a house hack. We weren't renting out while we were living there. But the cool thing about using different strategies. We, we used a pure house hack where we rented out the other units. We used a house that was just a simple house, 1400 square feet, three bedroom, two bath, but those make the best rentals. Like the big, huge dream houses that are 2,500 square feet. Those have a lot of maintenance. They have two heating and air units. There are too many things that can break, too many costs. So those simple little rental houses, I've known people, this goes to the small and mighty kind of concept, who've just done that three or four times. They've just moved out of a house, rented it out, or moved into a fourplex, yeah. rented it out do that three or four yeah. times and they're done. Like that's, that's their rental portfolio. And I think that's, we have a, friends. That's brilliant. We have friends who do that with a family of five, every house they live in, they are fixing up. They love fixing up the house. They also love moving. So they just mm -hmm. find the next one, move yep. into the next house, fix it up. Next house, fix it up. I want to ask two questions before I dive into really the process that you walk into in the early chapters of your new project to get where you want to go. But I want to ask about if you're buying locally, do you use things like, I never know how to pronounce this. Is it Renometer, Retometer? Uh, are you going to like Zillow? Uh, what tools are you using to evaluate which neighborhoods are good, which areas are good? Yeah, it's a combination of analytics. So using you can use free tools like Zillow. I think it's, I don't know if it's Rentometer or Rentometer. You, yeah, there's a lot of cool tools. And I, I go to Zillow a lot, but all of them are pretty good. And here's like the analytical side. And I also tell you just the different kind of qualitative side where you just get out in the market and walk around. The analytical side, the thing you want to do, my recommendation for people is to find 100 properties that have sold in the last year. So if you look on Zillow, the, the one everybody just looks at the listed properties, which is, is okay. They're the little red dots, but actually switch the Zillow screen to look at the yellow dots, which are the properties that have sold uh, yeah. and just filter them for the last year. And what you want to do is you want to look at properties that other people have already bought, especially the lower price ones. Like Challenge yourself to look at the ones that were the, the 50 lowest price sales or the 10 lowest price sales in your neighborhood and study those. Like, who, who bought those? Why did they buy them? I wonder what they're renting that for. And you can just go down these little rabbit holes. And I call that, that's kind of like if you were an athlete, that's like doing your reps, that's doing your workout. This is the workout of a real estate investor is just looking at properties over and over again. If you can look at them on Zillow to start, if you're local, go out and drive around and look at them, talk to people in the neighborhood. That's kind of the homework of just what the goal there. If I were uh, sitting in a car next to you in your market, you ought to be able to look at each one of those houses and tell me, Chad, that property sold for 150 thousand that property sold for three hundred thousand that one rents for fifteen hundred bucks just bam going down the list i should be able yes. to nail it 
Yes. And, and if that sounds overwhelming, start small, start in one little neighborhood of 50 properties. Like you can figure out every property that sold in the last year in one little neighborhood and then expand from there and expand from there. So that's like part one of your homework. Do the analytical part just so you're comfortable with numbers. The second part is real estate is very, it's an emotional game. Like people rent houses or buy houses because they want to live there because it's emotional for their family. It satisfies something. And so real estate, you need to kind of understand, I had a mentor call it romance. Romance is the factor that draws somebody to a neighborhood. Like, why are they living there? Is it a bike trail? Is it a park? Is it because it's convenient to the little coffee shop? Some people invest within a mile of Starbucks. That's like their strategy. They just find Starbucks and draw a circle around it and do that. But the common theme there is romance, is finding the emotional trigger that draws somebody to a neighborhood. And sometimes that means you're not going to buy the cheapest houses. Like the cheapest houses might not be romantic at all. They might be super affordable, but they don't have that draw. And, but if you can combine the analytics, the good numbers with the romance of a good neighborhood, then you'll have something that's in demand. Like your tenants will want to live there. You'll never have a problem renting your properties. And I found that combining those two, like I missed the romance part early in my career. I just went for the numbers and I missed the emotional draw. And I had some uh, property. yeah. so properties that look good on the spreadsheet, but man, they were really hard to rent and they're hard to keep good tenants. But it's interesting you say that because we stayed at a house uh, that was really interesting, an Airbnb property in Minneapolis when we were recently there. We had a group of uh, six of us. And so it, rather than get you know, three hotel rooms or whatever, we decided to, to get a house for all of us. There was no romance in this neighborhood. There was no romance in the house. I didn't even know at the time they did a great job with the pictures and fooled us because we didn't realize it was one bathroom and it was on the second floor and it was tiny. Mm. Um, and it was, you know, it was, it was part of a bunch of townhouses all connected together. So it wasn't a great property. What was cool, Chad, that the person, the Airbnb person did, they created the romance. They put a foosball table and a couple of arcade games like you know big arcade cabinets like you go to an arcade at a you know an old mall or whatever it yeah. might be yeah. uh they put those in this one room and it was funny because then they called it the game house so they kind of created with their property for right. truly not much money romance because what was neat for us was that i had my niece with us who was 11 we don't travel with her much and it was really our we take one of my brother's kids he's got eight kids we take one on a big trip that we're taking to get to know them, you know, just them. And I thought, oh, how cool for my niece to be able to sit and play these video games. This person created the romance in the house. Yeah, super smart. So that's why you got to study principles and then try to apply them in different ways. Like I would have never thought of the arcade and doing that, but they've taken something, a concept, which is you, you got to make people smile. You got like housing is something, whether it's a short-term housing or long-term housing, this is an emotional game. Like that's what people got to remember. Like this is something where people have to be happy. They have to feel fulfilled. They feel got to feel connected. And so if you can tap into those emotions, whether it's an arcade, whether it's a park, whether it's a bike trail, whether it's a Starbucks, like that. That's, that's really the name of the game. But if we're trying to build, so we're trying to build a small but mighty empire, we're really trying to focus on these other currencies. We need enough money to fulfill these other currencies. And you definitely walk into the philosophy that's much more than we will today. But you say the first thing we have to do is we have to find out what's that number we need to live, right? That is job one. What is that number? What are some of the thoughts that go into creating this number I need to get these other currencies working for me? Yeah, like real estate's a very you know short-term tactical game. You're buying properties, you're getting financing, you're in the weeds. But I, I like to take people when you first start or then along the way, have a compass, like have a big goal. It's almost like you're climbing up the top of the mountain. What's the top of the mountain? And most people just sort of assume like there's this fuzzy goal, like oh, I probably need tons of properties to actually have financial freedom with rentals. But I like to break it down and just offer a simple goal. Like let's just say that you're number is $10,000 a month. If it's 20, you can double this. If it's five, you can take half of this. But if your number was 10,000 a month is what your family needed to pay your bills, to you know live financially free, then how could real estate do that? Well, one way is, let's say you had 10 houses and each one of those houses rented for $1,800 per month, 1,800. And let's also assume that each one of those houses had about $800 in expenses, like operating expenses, like taxes, insurance, maintenance, yeah, capital expenses, replacing the roof, things like that, vacancy. So all of these expenses that you need to run the property, except for your mortgage payment. So let's just assume, fast forward to the top of the mountain, you've paid off those properties and you paid off your debt. It'd take a little time, like five, 10 years, maybe a little bit longer to do that, but you paid your properties off. When you rent that property out, 1,800 minus 800, you have $1,000 left over that goes into your bank account because you're not making a mortgage payment. If you have 10 of those, that's $10,000. 
1,000 times 10. And I know that's simple math. I know that's going to sound super basic. And some people may have like that, Chad, that's the most obvious math thing I've ever seen. <laughs> that's the point. The point is you don't need a lot of properties to accomplish an amazing financial goal, like $10,000 per month. Like people that, that doesn't happen. That's the 1% of the 1% in the United States, but a really simple portfolio could do that. And yes, there's some work to do there. Yes. How do you get the debt paid off? Yes. How do you buy those properties? How do you finance them? That's, those are the nuts and bolts. That's important too. But I, I want to start with that because if, if you think you have to have this huge ambitious empire, if you have this big ambitious empire to, to make it happen, then you'll maybe do a different strategy as opposed to doing something super simple. Yeah. I got super excited about that because as we talk to different investors, some people prefer a property manager, some people don't. But if I only have a portfolio of 10 properties, properties and they're local or they're all local to each other, not even local to me or in two or three different cities, I can create teams fairly simply in those cities and I can begin cutting out some of these costs with my own internal systems to get away from all these, um, you know, the proper term isn't leeches because because <laughs> there's some great property managers and they help a lot of our deeders, but you can get rid of a lot of these fees that a lot of real estate investors will pay. Yeah, you can negotiate. I mean, I have property managers. So when I've lived abroad and lived in other countries with my family, like we have property managers help us and also do some self-management. So I do both. But the more efficient you are with your properties, like I like to tell people the the hardest properties to manage are is a result of you buying the wrong properties. It's not necessarily the tenant. It's not necessarily the property manager. The property itself attracts the best long-term tenants who stay a long time, who don't turn over. So if you buy those properties in the right location with the right type of properties, then it becomes so much, I mean, it's not just twice as easy to, to manage. It's like 10 times easier to manage by buying the right properties and by having a smaller amount. If you have 100 properties, you have to manage systems and people and all this stuff. And you have this empire. And instead of you managing a small thing, you're, you're managing, I call it a Frankenstein monster. It can, be, it can take over your life, <laughs> can eat all your time, but a small portfolio, very manageable, pretty easy to do. So we start off with how much income you need. You define that. We determine then the net operating income of an average rental in your area. And then we do the simple math to determine how many you need. In this case, in your math, it was 10. You have different levels of real estate investor. This show is definitely to help people start, to help them get off the, I think this is doable, but I really want the push to do it. So you define these people as starters, what strategies should starters use? What should starters really be thinking about to get off the couch and go do it? So the starters typically have two huge challenges. One, the money. Two, the knowledge. And I would actually add a third, your relationships, your team. But the money is, I think, the one that people think about a lot. And so you just, you got to be creative. You got to think about, I offered a strategy earlier, house hacking. House hacking is one of my favorite ways to get started. And there's a simple reason. Simple reason is that financing is a lot easier when you move into a house. Because you can get 5% down loans. You can get 3.5% down loans. If you're a veteran, you can get a 0% down loan. That's a huge difference if you're buying a $300,000 property to be able to get a 3.5% or 5% down loan instead of having to put 20 or 25% down. That could be the difference between you waiting five years or 10 years to get into the game and doing it today. And I, I think that's such a critical piece is that you just got to figure out a tool to get into the game. And it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean you're going to hit a home run. To use a baseball metaphor, like you just got to hit base hits. You just got to, if you're bunting to get on base or if you're hitting the ugliest little grounder, but you, you run to first base because you're a hustler and you just get down the line, perfect. But you got to get in the game. And I think that's my message to starters is be scrappy, figure out a way to do it, whether it's house hacking. I used a lot of partnerships when I first started and I just took the attitude that I would rather have 25% of a deal than 0% of no deal. I mean, 100% of, no, of no deal. I'd rather have 25% of something than 100% of nothing. And so that's, you just got to get in the game. And, and I even give you a specific number in the book, like get to four properties, like just get to four and then let's take a break and think about it. And you can decide whether real estate's for you or whether you're out of this game 100% or whether you want to grow a little bit more, but just focus on get the money for those deals and focus on building relationships with people and just get, you're going to learn so much when you do those first four deals, much more than you could ever learn in a book, uh, than you can learn on a podcast, but you just got to get started. You talk about short-term, medium-term rentals versus long-term rentals, turnkey long-term versus uh, fixer-upper long-term rentals. Which of those are your favorite? I look at them like tools in a toolbox. Like if you were building a house, you wouldn't say like one tool is better than the other. 
some tools like short-term rentals are great. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on, Chad. You say that about your kids too, don't you? They're all, they're, they're all, I love them all equally, but we all know you got that yeah. one kid, don't you? We got it's that one really kind of, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm not a short-term rental person. Although if I were starting again today and I wanted to get to financial independence really fast, like I would consider short-term rentals because on average, the students that I work with have at least two to three times more cash flow on a good short-term rental with the same exact property than they would with a long-term rental. Now that's the positive. The downside is you're going to have a little, it's more of a hospitality business. It's like a little mini hotel basically. Yeah. So you've yeah. got to build some systems. You got to do a little bit more work, although that's possible today. But if your goal is just to generate as much cash flow as you can to reinvest and to buy more properties or to get out of your job that you're not really keen on, then short-term rentals are great. But there's a lot of caveats there. You got to be careful where you're investing. There's been cities that are banning short-term rentals altogether. So you, you got to study. It's not just like a catch-all strategy that works everywhere, but it's a great strategy for cash flow. I lean more towards long-term rentals because I like the passive nature of it. I say that long-term rentals are passive enough. There's no such thing as 100% passive investment, but I've spent literally two hours per week or less for the last five or six years on my rental properties because they're stable, because I'm already, you know, I'm not buying and selling a lot. I'm not remodeling them. And so two hours a week from anywhere in the world, like passive, that that's passive that's, enough that's pretty to, passive. Do, to do whatever you need to do. And that's the point about long-term rentals. They're just a super solid income generating, wealth generating vehicle that doesn't take a ton of your time. I think it's why you and I get along so well is with a guy that went to real estate, didn't start with, with any real estate in my portfolio, had some and getting back into real estate. I, whenever anybody t tries to sell me this snake oil that it's a hundred percent passive, I'm like, you're full of crap. <laughs> just, just stop selling me snake oil. There just yeah. isn't. But to your point, you, the, a small but mighty empire, if you build it correctly. I love the advice, especially though, Chad, getting to four, because I feel like with four rentals, you're at the point where you have to develop systems at that point, right? Yeah. So you're kind of f forced into it. And once you start developing, it's kind of like the 80% rule. If you get 80% of the way into it, you're just going to keep going. So yeah. now that we're 80% in with these four, now we're going to start finding these tools, technologies, people around us to build the system that we need. Yeah. After starter, after starter, you go on to builder. What's the difference between a starter and a builder? What's that next level to give our deeders like kind of the, that's what's right over the hill. Yeah. And so if the starter's main goal is just to get in the game, to get to those four properties, to learn, to get some momentum, a wealth builder's main goal is to grow. Just to give you an example, if you have $100,000 or $50,000 in, in the bank account, your goal as a builder is to turn that 50,000 bucks into $500,000 or a million dollars. That's it. You are in growth mode. You're climbing that mountain and your goal is to safely, but consistently get up that mountain to a higher net worth. You want to build equity. And so this is where like the traditional terms you've heard of, like the Burr strategy, where you, you know, recycle your debt by buying a, rent, a fixer upper property and getting it fixed up and rented out. You get it stabilized and then you go back and refinance it with a long term loan. That's the end of the Burr. And then you do it again. You recycle your money. That's a prototypical growth strategy because the goal there is you're going to run out of money pretty soon. You're going to put down payments on a property, but you want to do another one. So how do you get yeah. that money? Well, you either you get creative by recycling it, by refinancing it, or I didn't do a whole lot of birth strategies in my own examples. I used more private money. I used partners, as I mentioned earlier. So somehow, some way though, you're going to use leverage. And that could be good and bad. You know, leverage is wonderful because it's a way to grow a big portfolio without having a lot of your own money. There's also some downsides. And I don't, I like to talk about the downsides too, because if you're not careful, I've known people who got a business because only for one reason in real estate, I've had several friends, several colleagues go out of business because they got leverage that put them out of business debt. Yeah. Right. So uh, you got to be careful, but at the same time, that's the name of the game as a wealth builder. But what's funny is your whole goal is to help people stunt their growth here. Like, let's, <laughs> let's just stunt your growth so you can live more life. The book is called Small and Mighty Real Estate Investor, How to Reach Financial Freedom with Fewer Rental Properties. It's going to be out in just a couple of weeks. If people want to pre-order it, Chad, how do they do it? Well, you can go to Bigger Pockets is the, the best place. And I think we'll have a link you know, in the show notes or in the, the sure description, description. So check that out. There's a lot of bonuses I have at Bigger Pockets. Like, for example, I did a, a bonus chapter that they wouldn't let me fit in there called Small and Mighty Investing in 2023. So in a changing economy with interest rates high. Uh, so that's the place to go to get the best deal. But then it'll also be on Audible. It'll be on Amazon. It'll be on Barnes and Noble, all the, all the normal places as well. And would uh, love it if people checked it out. Did you uh, do the Audible yourself? 
Unfortunately, no. I did the I did the oh, last one. Really? <laughs> yes, I ran out of time. I was traveling a lot in Spain, and and just for whatever reason, we 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 got crunched. So if you hear somebody with a California accent on this Southern guys, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the Southern draw, that's 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 why. <laughs> <laughs> that's fabulous. Well, fantastic. Thanks for hanging out and helping our Dieters uh, get off the couch, man, and get going. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And big thanks to Chad for hanging out with us. You know, Crystal, he makes a great point that currencies, like we all think about dollar bills when we think about currency, but your time as a currency and the fact that you can't get it back, I think is a huge currency that even when we've interviewed time management experts, I'm thinking about a woman named Ashley Winnens from Harvard and Laura Vanderkam, who was on the Stacky Benjamin show several times. You know, we all overestimate the amount of time that we have and how we can just take time later. And we overestimate our need for money for everything. And I think Chad makes a great point there that you need to look at these other currencies. Yeah. Time versus money. Like time is limited. And a lot of people don't embrace that when they're chasing after these, you know, bigger, oh, I want to grow and this and that. And a lot of times that's not what you need. And I thought it was cool that he brought up they bought 33 properties in a year. That's nuts. And he said it was not a good idea. He's like, (laughs) we even had to dip into our reserves, you know, just to stay afloat. So good thing he had reserves before he hopped into this. Yeah. And I also do like before you keep going on, I also like just the way he started, though, because he did start Mm -hmm. with almost no money. You know, Mm -hmm. a lot of people think you got to have a lot of money. Instead, it's the value of partnerships. And you and I know that next week we've got a great woman talking about partnerships. Vicki Barron is going to be our guest. And boy, she's going to talk about some of the partnerships she's been able to. Well, Vicki Barron can talk anybody into anything. Yeah, (laughs) she's definitely great. But about Chad, I like how he actually gave our listeners homework, too, because you do you want to be prepared. So I like how he was saying to find 100 properties that sold in the last year. That way, you're getting well versed on what sold for what, what rents for that, because he said, take the time to learn the fundamentals. He said, fundamentals don't change no matter where the property is, no matter where the zip code is. Yeah, it's funny. When I was talking to Chad, I was thinking about all the different, you know, business owners or people that lead businesses. And they always talk about the same thing. It's no different with real estate where you have to look for your niche. Where do I fit in? That'll create Mm -hmm. your pricing strategy. It'll create your marketing strategy. You can only do that if you actually go out and hit the streets and do the research. And you and I talk a lot about, you know, I mean, today we talked about Hemlane in the middle of Doug's trivia. We talk about using technology as your friend all the time, Mm -hmm. surrounding yourself with good people. You still need to know the numbers yourself. You need, right. You need and you to need to understand market. the fundamentals. They don't change neighborhood to neighborhood. You know, it's the same yes or no. Let the spreadsheets do the math for you and let you know if this is something you can do or not. Like, leave it to the math, not the emotion. This is Ruth's phone generally is ringing today. I actually got a text message today from a listener called Ann who sent us a TikTok. Don't you mean yeah. you got a fax message? Facts. I could have on the dot matrix. The dot matrix didn't run today. I don't know why. (sighs) Yes, I actually did get a text message. And this came from Ann. And well, let's just have a little listen. What's it say? Here's what realtors say versus what they actually mean. Super cozy in here. It's really small. This is an up and coming neighborhood. This neighborhood is in the middle of nowhere. It's quirky. Nothing in here matches. Bring your creativity. You're going to spend a lot of time and money fixing this place up. Motivated seller. They're desperate. Handyman or investor special. Run. It's got good bones. It's a total gut job. (laughs) Uh, Thanks, Dan. (laughs) You do have to know the language, Crystal, I think is the point. Yes. And another thing about the language, though, It'll either bring you to the property or away because, you know, there's different kind of investors. There are people that are looking for handyman specials. So they know, hey, 
put on your negotiating hat because this is going to have an awful inspection. So you better use that to your advantage and say, okay, handyman special, I need some concessions or I need you to come down on that price because I'm going to spend so much money on this property fixing it up. And the more you can point out ahead of time exactly yeah. what you're going to fix up, like specifically, hey, I'm going to have to replace this. I'm going to have to replace this. I'm going to have to replace this. So I need you to come down X. I think if you oh, say, yeah. I need creativity you to come down X. and a respirator, because <laughs> <laughs> there might be some black mold. I don't know what that is. Going hey, gas there. mask lovers, this is perfect for you. <laughs> <laughs> Lead paint. You, you know, want to pretend it's an apocalyptic future? Live here. <laughs> But motivated seller. Yeah. Oh, that was Motiv good. Motivated seller. Yeah, they are. Desperate. Motivated seller means, yeah, that there's some price flexibility. So some of this stuff can be music to your ears for motivated seller. And you'll hear that when we talk to Vicky next week also, because she talks about the importance of asking questions too to get that. So if they don't put that in the listing, shame on the realtor for not knowing all these things about the buyer. But the more questions you ask, works the in more, your favor. Yeah, that all works in your favor. You know, and it's funny if it says it's cozy in here, you got to ask yourself <laughs> too, Crystal, if I buy this place and I might get a discount, can I just change up the furniture? Like you don't have to have a degree in interior design, but man, there's a great masterclass that Cheryl and I are watching right now. That's on interior design. There's a few masterclasses out there. If anybody's got a subscription to masterclass. And once again, this is a business expense, right? Mm -hmm. if oh. this, this would be a business expense. So if you sign up for masterclass, or even if you watch some YouTube videos on interior design or on staging, I think you can take some of these phrases like it's cozy or it's quirky and you can design creatively some things to do with these spaces. I know this designer that I'm watching on Masterclass right now, she is a house that has a beautiful stairway. And what they did was they realized that underneath it, they didn't have any load bearing stuff. So it was being held up from the top and from the bottom, but there was no oh, load no. bearing along the side. So they were able to take that out. And they created like a cozy little nook. But what was cool was the owners of this house wanted a bar because they like to entertain. They didn't have any room in their house for a bar, but they did have about three feet <laughs> behind the drywall that was empty space. So Aww. underneath that, they ripped out underneath the stairs, which gave them maybe three or four feet. And then they ripped out this closet and they made it so that there's a hidden door bar. And it was so oh, cool that you nice. could open up the wall. And as the wall came out now along the wall that was open is all of your alcohols. And then there was a little ledge there and these yeah. two bar stools that were sitting in this little nook underneath the stairs, you just move them over a little bit. And now you're sitting at a bar with this flat screen TV. So they made a, a speakeasy speak is what you're they saying. They did. <laughs> Inside yeah. their house. It was so, it was Hidden so alcohol. Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Nobody but will know that I need a 12 step program. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the good news about deciphering these listings and knowing the lingo, because that can also give you an opportunity to customize. Yeah, because yeah. maybe if they're too done up or too nice, you know, you're paying premium, but it's move in ready, you know, so that's less expenses for construction or that's less opportunity for customization. So Absolutely. that's something that you'll have to think about. Well, great episode today, Crystal. Let's wrap it up with some community news. First of all, if people want to get the show notes, where do they go? You head to stackingdeeds.net slash show notes. And also, if you have a question for us to answer, or if you want to send us a tic tac, I was going to say a breath a mint, but you can't, you can't hear our breath I was going to say something yeah. to you, actually. <laughs> but if you want to send us a fax, a text message, head to stackingdeeds.net slash voicemail, and then we will answer your question live on the show. Coming up on Friday on the Stacking Benjamin Show, our sister show, is a discussion you might want to listen to. We have Christine Benz from Morningstar joining OG and Paula Pant from Afford Anything to talk about taxes. We talked about taxes in our headlines mm -hmm. and talking about having your money in the right place. So if you need a little bit more primer on taxes, go over and listen to the Friday Stacking Benjamin Show. But back here next Tuesday... We have one of the top realtors in New York, which means we could probably say one of the top realtors in the world, Crystal. 
Yeah, because she was on Selling New York back in the day when that first came out. Her name is Vicki Barron. She has a brand new book out talking about how every move matters. She is an expert at negotiation, at about rephasing your question to build bridges, about building teams. We're going to talk about all those things, which are so important when you're trying to buy the right property, you're trying to fix it up, you're trying to put the right people in your corner. Vicki Barron knows all that. So that is uh, what's coming up next week. But for now, I think, Crystal, time for us to say goodbye. People can find you on Twitter. Say hi. Yep, at Condo Crystal on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. You can friend me on Facebook, too, if you want. <laughs> and the gram. Say hi to me, Average Joe Money. I do have Average Joe Money on Instagram as well as uh, Twitter. Do we start calling it X? Oh, I don't know. I don't, That's I, I don't so know. weird. I just was reading an article, and it was the first time I'd seen where it said on X, comma, formerly Twitter, comma, and then it went on. And I'm we're like, gonna refer right. to the, That's we're too gonna, soon. We're going to refer to X the way we refer to Prince, right? Yeah. Formerly right. known yeah. as Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm Average Joe Money. Also Average Joe Money on Instagram, but I'm never there. If you're going to hit me up on Instagram, just go to Stacky Benjamin's Instagram account because – I always feel bad when people try to talk to me at Average Joe Money on Instagram because I see it like four months later. <laughs> like, oh, well. <laughs> All right. That's it for today. Doug, man, lots of takeaways, but what are our top three? Well, Joe and Crystal, first, take some advice from Chad Carson. Real estate empire? Think about the other currencies, like your time and freedom, and factor those into your plan. You may be able to live a wealthier life than you think on a lot less property. Second, taxes? Make sure you have the right tax help in your corner. That's maybe the second most important team member. Behind us, of course. But the big lesson? Speaking of tornadoes, Ruth's like a tornado when she pulls out into the passing lane. If you see her giant 1985 Lincoln driving near you, I'd recommend seeking shelter. Seriously. Thanks to Coach Chad Carson for joining us today. You can find his book, Small and Mighty Real Estate Investor, How to Reach Financial Freedom with Fewer Rental Properties, wherever books are sold. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingdeeds.net. This is what a simple brain I have. I saw the dot com and I'm like, I'm kind of going to stop. stop. I'm here. Oh, God, the horror.